We have another correction in the bulletin for today. If you would open your bulletin to just after the Nicene Creed, which is the hymn of the day, hymn number 717. Service Builder did not make a distinction between two versions of this hymn. And so we have both versions mixed together. So the stanzas that we will sing in hymn number 717 is stanza one, skip stanza two, the first two, and sing the second two, skip again, and on the next page, stanza three A. One, the second two, and 3A, and we're sorry for this confusion. The psalmist writes, In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Very comforting words. We begin then with the singing of hymn number 726, Evening and Morning.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. We kneel for confession. The Ninth Commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. We should fear and love God so that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or get it in a way which only appears right, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. Have I longed for the honor, wealth, happy life, or what seemed the ease of the lives of others? Has my life been full of the craving for these things? Have I been stingy and self-indulgent with my money, trying to keep up with what others have? Have I tried by claims to various rights to make the property of another my own? O Almighty God, merciful Father, I Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul the Lord and he is me, and he is me my Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them.
I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, preserve us from all harm and danger, that we, being ready in body and soul, may cheerfully accomplish what you want done. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the 10th Sunday after Pentecost is from Job chapter 38. The Lord said to Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? when I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescri prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no further and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. 
Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. The epistle is from Romans chapter 10. Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, Command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess the Christian faith in the words of a Nicene Creed. I believe in...
In the name of Jesus, amen. My dad always told me when trying to hit a baseball or catch a football to keep your eye on the ball. It's a simple command, but it can be easily forgotten when either fear or overconfidence gets the best of us. Whether fear by getting hit by a hard fastball pitched right at you or a bruising defensive back on your tail to tackle you. Or then there's the overconfidence when we get ahead of ourselves, already looking for the home run before we hit the ball. Or looking at that end zone before we catch the football. And then you hear this, strike three, you're out. Or the crowd's groan of disbelief when an easily catchable ball deflects off your fingers. The spirit sinks in disappointment knowing better, but not doing it. And if that home run and that touchdown meant winning the game, then that disappointment could easily slide into a crushing depression. And that is the nature of sports. And even more so in life where the stakes are much higher. How we handle the troubles and the distress that is sure to come in a world full of sin matters. It matters where our eyes are kept in those moments. No one is immune to great disappointment. No one is immune to the despair that can haunt the sinful soul. Or from those moments when the world beats us down and anxiety overcomes us and we cry out, I can't handle this anymore. Or when it seems that the devil has won and there's no use now in resisting it any longer. I am done. Dark moments come. Even for God's people, they come. We try hard to raise our kids rightly, only to find that just one friend's negative influence can undo everything we ever taught them. Or one family crisis is followed by another and then another. Or one illness overcome is followed by another illness to be overcome. And then there's that constant depressing erosion of morality in an increasingly godless culture that we live in. Or why can't we do the things that we want to do and the evil we don't want to do, we keep on doing, even as Christians. So name your poison. When we lay our eyes on these things, and these things grab our attention and our focus. Despair sets in. Fear begins to take hold. And then we find ourselves eventually at the end of our rope. And here then we get to the what. Faith. Where our eyes are to be fixed, focused, so that we as God's people do not despair that we do not in any circumstances fear, but this, believe, says Jesus, O oh, you a little faith. The waves distressed the boat. Literally, it tortured it. The disciples are exhaustingly battle-worn by a headwind that was determined to capsize them. They're at the end of their rope, as the boat is itself, under that constant strain of wave after wave after wave breaking against it, breaking against them. The Sea of Galilee is known for these sudden violent storms, and now they were caught in one, and they were way off from the shore. And so fear sets in, fear of capsizing, drowning, dying. They are consumed by their circumstances. And on top of that, they see a ghost of all things coming toward them, walking on the water. What now is this? Death coming to take our souls? This cannot be good. Where is Jesus? God help us. That is the question, isn't it? In those tumultuous times, where is he? Where is he in my suffering? He's right there. 
He places himself in their full view, in the midst of their distress in the storm. Yet, as one who was not affected by it, but calm and in control, as both Lord over the storm and Savior from it. He is building their faith in him to teach them who he really is, God, so that they learn not to fear, not to fall into despair, though the world crumble around them. But as we so simply say in that little catechism, but call upon him in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. This is to teach them, and it's to teach us, that when the storms of life assail us, in their midst, look nowhere else than to Jesus himself. And he is there for you to see, made known and visible to you in his word, that your eyes are always on Jesus, the founder and the perfecter or finisher of your faith. And he is there to teach them and to teach you that he and faith go together. Saving faith goes together with Jesus and his saving word and works. Faith by nature is nothing if there is nothing to have faith in. I've heard it said in our culture many times, it doesn't matter what you believe in, just believe. Well, just believe then means nothing. In other words, faith has its being in the very thing that it believes and trusts in. And it has the very thing that it believes and trusts in. So faith is key here. This is what Jesus is teaching us. But why then is this distinction important? Because it affects where our eyes are and upon whom they are. And to who do we look to for our good and our life in everything? Eyes on Jesus. Jesus walks on the water in the midst of the storm to teach us without doubt that he is God. And all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. There is nothing happening in this world that God is not in control of. God allows the storms of life to arise. And it wakes us up back to him, our eyes back to him, to focus on him, the only one who can guide us through safely to the other side of eternal life. Though turbulent wind and waves swirled around him, his path was calm and smooth because that wind and wave were in submission to him and they were at his beck and call as they still are to this very day, as they fell before him. Jesus is Lord. He is in control, and he comes. He comes for his disciples. He comes for you, and in a way that will teach you without doubt that he alone is the one who delivers you. He alone is your Savior in every need. And God often lets us then get to the end of ourselves that we have no other alternative but to cry out to him, God, I am yours. Save me. At first, they didn't recognize Jesus. The way he came to them terrified them. He came to them in a way that no man could come to them, miraculously, as only one who is supernatural can do. This would not be the only time this would happen. Neither would they recognize him on the cross as Savior. He was not supposed to die. He was supposed to deliver us. People do not recognize Jesus as God and Savior because it is not what they expect of him. They were terrified. They were terrified to see their master beaten and dying horribly on a cross. 
fear and despair would again overtake them on Mount Calvary. He could help them no more, so it seemed. And so it seemed that the devil had finally won. So it seemed that the turbulent wind and waves of the Pharisees' hatred and plots to distress and kill Jesus had finally come to beat him down for good. That was the ultimate storm of storms. Not only does it affect them as his disciples, but this is the storm that got the best of Jesus. So it seemed. What no one else knew, because they didn't expect it, is that it was God's plan and way all along. Jesus, in every moment, was in full control, even when everything else seemed contrary, as he is in your life. He suffered all distress on the cross. All that distresses us is the work of sin in us and in others around us. That is why he then points to his death in our times of distress. Remember him and him crucified, says Paul. So look and see, eyes on Jesus, that not even the sins of a whole world could destroy him. Yes, he died as planned and willed by the Father. And then he rose again. He paid that price of all sin. And with it, he destroys death. And so he lives again. And this is the one who can die no more. He lives forever. But know this, it was in your place. He lives for you because he died for you. And so he comes for you. Forever Jesus in body and soul, for your body and soul, safely in heaven. As the disciples were terrified when they saw him walking toward them on water, so too when they saw him miraculously appear in their midst after his crucifixion. Both times they thought they saw a ghost. Both times they were in distress, under the duress of pending death. And the sight of him distressed them even more. It is a ghost. But then he said, he spoke the word, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peace be with you. Peace in a tumultuous world. Peace that surpasses all human understanding. Peace that keeps the heart and the mind on him. Peace. Eyes focused on Jesus. And this peace he gives to you. That fear, distress, despair, not get the best of you. It is the devil's work to make you despair. It is the devil's work to get your eyes off of Jesus. When God seems distant to us from our distress and all the turbulence that surrounds our life, the devil tells you that God is aloof. He's off shopping somewhere or lounging on a beach somewhere in paradise. He doesn't really care. Or he cannot or will not help you. And that is a lie. And he uses it to spark doubt in you, just as he did Eve, in order to turn you away from God and put your eyes elsewhere, onto something else for your life and your good, even upon yourself, knowing that in the end you will only despair more when you find yourself totally lost to God. Which means eyes on Jesus. It matters where your faith is is and in whom it is when peter recognized jesus and he beheld the power and the glory of god that stands firm and untouched by a storm faith surged in him his eyes were on jesus and he called out that he may come to jesus and all that was needed then 
was for Jesus to speak the word, to give the command, and Jesus did. Come, Peter. And he did. And so here's the core of the teaching. Faith and word go together. Word and Jesus are the same. Jesus is the word of God. All eyes on Jesus means all ears on his word. With faith and eyes on Jesus, Peter did what no man can do. It was the impossible. He walked on water. And this he did in the midst of a turbulent sea, a storm raging around him. And by faith in Jesus' word, Peter entered into the calm of Jesus' presence. And that faith and that word held him there until he took his eyes off of Jesus and began to look around him once again at all the turbulence, and he began to doubt. The threat of the storm unnerved him. Faith gave way to fear, fear then to despair, despair to doubt, and doubt began to take Peter down into the depths of the sea just as sin does us into the depths of the earth. Faith leads to Jesus. Doubt leads to sin and away from Jesus and his word and ultimately to bury us alive in the chamber of death and hell. But be comforted, O you of little faith, for faith comes from hearing the word of Christ, as we heard in the epistle reading. And that word tells us in the gospel that Peter's little faith was sufficient to cry out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out and took him by the hand. In the midst of the storm, peace and calm was restored to Peter. In the midst of the storms in your life and your deep suffering, peace comes again in the presence of Jesus. In Peter's weakness, here is a good example where the Lord's divine power is made perfect and so strengthened Peter again in his faith. Peter was walking again on water with Jesus. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And all eyes were on Jesus, and they worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Exactly. They got it. Truly, you are the Son of God. Truly, you are the Son of God. So what is it that Jesus is teaching? It means simply this. Remember it. Eyes on Jesus So that when we are sick and distressed, and we are in danger, and we are even dying, lacking in faith as we usually do, wondering where is Jesus, well, he's right there with you. We look always to him and to him alone. And what then do we see in this? We see him in the midst of our distress as he now is crucified and risen again, calm and in control, victorious over every infirmity that we suffer, and even death itself, in the peace of heaven. Not for him, but for you. I just found this little piece of scripture when I was writing the sermon. I came across it in Psalm 71, and I thought, how Connected is it to what we are hearing. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, writes the psalmist. Remarkable. For you are my rock and my fortress. 
Where is he? Where is Jesus in this tumultual, tumultuous, sin-tossed world? He is here. Here, in the ark of his church, where his hand stretches forth from heaven to grab hold of you and to bring you back upward heavenly in health and life and faith and all that is good and right and true eternally before him. My heart faints with the Lord. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, both David's son and David's Lord, thanks be to you because you undertook the battle against our enemies and you ransomed us from the power of them that hated us. As you now sit at the right hand of the Father, a Lord over all things, be our rock and our defense, our buckler and the captain of our salvation, that in your name we may defy and despise the very gates of hell, triumphing over them forever and ever. Let us pray. O Lord our God, we do not presume to know your ways or to inform your judgment. Grant us your Holy Spirit so that we apprehend your ways and know your Son by faith. Give us wisdom to trust in your word amid the stormy seas of this mortal life and be safely delivered from all danger onto the eternal shores of heaven. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, our God, we have no righteousness of our own that saves, but only that of Christ in which we were clothed in our baptism. Grant us grace to be faithful in every circumstance and bold in the confession of his saving name. Guard those who preach your word, that hearing we may believe and believing we may live eternally. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, our God, we ask you to bless us, our nation, and those who lead us. Guide all elected and appointed civil servants in all their judgments, that we may know true justice in our land and true peace among the nations. Make us especially mindful of those who do need our special protection, the unborn, the aged, and all the oppressed, Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, our God, we pray for your blessing, your guidance, and your protection upon our church, our school, all our Lutheran schools and universities and seminaries. Guard and protect from pestilence and all evil where your people gather to worship. Teach and learn your word. Help us to remember that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, our God, we remember the sick, the suffering and the troubled in mind, the grieving and dying. 
Deliver them, we pray, according to your will, and grant them the comfort of your word in their afflictions, that they may depend upon your mercy in every circumstance, and know that you are a very present help in time of need, especially for the family of Leonard Furman, who is Lisa Tucker's uncle, Leonard, who just recently passed away, and for Sula Daly, Danielle Bush, Lois Shahaki, Natalie Marquez, Ross King, James Parker, Jim Wheeler, Roy Hack, Rachel Otten, Sue Cameron, and Carol Robison. And we also pray for all of them who so compassionately and lovingly care for them. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord our God, we do not presume to come to this your table trusting in our own merits. Give us faith to discern the very body and blood of Christ for us and grant us repentance that we receive for our good his gift of himself in this blessed and holy communion. What we have received with our lips, help us keep in holy, upright, and godly lives. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Our Lord and our God, we give thanks for the saints of old who have trusted in you in life and now rest in perfect peace from all their labors. Deliver us, also from all evil and lead us through all temptations that at the last we may join them in the marriage supper of the lamb in your kingdom without end lord in your mercy Amen. and lord our god our light in darkness our strength in weakness our courage in fear and our peace in distress speak to us by the voice of your word that we daily call upon you in all trouble Pray, praise, and give thanks. And so confess your saving name before all people. Hear us on behalf of ourselves and those for whom we have prayed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. <clears throat> Lift up your hearts. <clears throat> Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore praising you and saying, Our Father, who art in heaven,
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Know indeed that all your sins are forgiven. Depart in peace. Amen. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.
Good morning, and welcome, everyone, and especially to our visitors today. What a great day to gather together and to hear the word and to have our uh, faith strengthened in the word of the Lord and to know that God is truly with us always. Even in the midst of this pandemic, he is with us, standing calm and in control of all things. Therefore, I am happy to announce that we will this week open our school. It is a big week for us. Many people have worked very hard to make sure that all reasonable safeguards are in place for our children and that we will also begin the necessity of educating them. And so I look forward to it. I look forward to the chapel, to the teaching, to the teachers, to everybody being back together again. What a blessing we have. Therefore, keep us in prayer throughout the days that lie ahead, that we always remember that Christ is with us. I was thinking of that in the third stanza. Thou camest to our hall of death, O Christ, to breathe our poisoned air to drink for us the dark despair that strangled our reluctant breath. How beautiful the feet that trod, the road that leads us back to God. How beautiful the feet that ran to bring the greatest news to man. And that speaks of the heart of what our school is about, learning about God in the right and true worldview. Thanks be to God for that. And an announcement that next Sunday we will have the rededication of our teachers here, and at the same time we will be installing our new interim principal, Paul Marinko. So please uh, be in prayer for our faculty and our new interim principal, and certainly we would like to see you here again next week. Have a wonderful week, and God's peace be with you.